Welcome to Grand Rock Warehouse, and tonight we are doing a career retrospective, the band Kick-Ass. Ladano's here, we're ready to go, let's Talking do it. bands no one talks about. Grant's Rock Warehouse. Welcome to Grant's Rock Warehouse, and tonight I want to welcome Mike Ladano to the show. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special treat for you, because we're going to talk about a little Canadian band called Kick-Ass. And after, uh, I, I must say this, before we get going, I had heard some kick acts. I was aware of them, but I hadn't really uh, dived into it. So uh, into the deep end, so to speak. And I will tell you, Mr. Ladano, this is quite a band. And this is really the type of show I like to do. I like to talk about these bands that, well, of course, no one's really talking about, but also these bands that I haven't really heard and I can discover. And this fits that bill to a T. Holy crap, I can hardly wait to get into it. So Mike, welcome to the show. Nice to see you. I hope for God's sakes you're ready to talk some kick acts. Dude, I've been ready for like two weeks. I've been listening to these four albums. Well, primarily the first three, but I've been listening to them solid mm -hmm. for the last two weeks. So uh, I'm ready now to I, kick some axe. Now, I've got the first three, but that fourth album, Kick Axe 4, is one of those records. Well, if you're going online to look for it, there it is. It's expensive. And I didn't opt to buy it, but I did listen to it on uh, YouTube Music. And, uh, well, we'll talk about it. I don't want to jump ahead right yet. Right. But uh, I think I'm just going to throw it over to you just to get us started. And uh, we'll look at these records. And really, all we are trying to do here today is turn you on to this band. Um, It's all about the music. So let, let's start it off. Mike, how are you? Nice to see you. Let's talk some kick acts. Let's talk some kick acts. Um, personal history here is in Canada, we had this thing called Much Music. We've talked about this before. It's our version of MTV. And they had a show called the Pepsi Power Hour. And we also have a thing in Canada called CanCon, which means that Canadian broadcasters must broadcast a certain percentage of Canadian content. So bands like kick -Ax had a leg up in Canada for that reason. Um, the Pepsi Power Hour used to play a video called On the Road to Rock. And I was always a fan of sort of like comedic metal videos, like Twisted Sister were the masters of that, Quiet Riot were the masters yeah. of that. Yeah. And On the Road to Rock opens with all these famous composers at a table and this Vice's guy, this this guy right here saying, I want to hear some new music. And all these classical composers are like, bum, 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 bum. And he's like, ah, stop that crap. That's garbage, you know. And he's like humiliating Beethoven and Mozart. And then this janitor walks in with a pair of headphones and you can hear on the headphones, it's playing the song Vices by Kickax. And the Vices guy goes, hey, what is that? Who, who, who are these guys? And then the janitor goes, well, that's Kickax. And then it goes into the song. And uh, it's very Twisted Sister, this music video. Um, you know, there's a classroom Kick Axe literally, literally barge down the door of the classroom, break in there, start jamming. Everybody gets metalized and turns into, you know, leather clothing and very funny stuff. And I was hooked. I was hooked. Weirdly enough, that you can't, I couldn't find these albums. And it's only in the last five years that I finally got a complete Kick Axe collection. You mean even where you are in Canada, it's hard to come by Kick Axe albums? Afraid so, um, at least when I was hunting for them. Uh, definitely on CD, they were hard to get. Now Rock Candy has reissued the first three. Um, I probably could have gone vinyl, but I wasn't... Eh. I'm, I'm not primarily a vinyl guy. Mm -hmm. I'm primarily a CD guy. Um, but I've only recently got the entire kick -Ax catalog, which I would love to show the audience because they have a lot more stuff than just the four albums for those in the know. But I have a question to ask, and I might know the answer, but I can't remember. Were Rock Candy the first label to reissue those out on CD? I don't recall. No. Well, out on CD before ever. They were only on vinyl, right? Um, I think there were some early CD pressings, especially okay. for Welcome to the Club, because that was 86. Okay. Um, there were reissues, but I will get to that because there's some interesting, interesting tidbits to be said. What label were they on back in the day? 
Pasha, Spencer Proffer's label. So if that I, rings a bell, we'll be touching on that too. We will be touching on that. But their first releases were independent. And this right here is their very first single called Weekend Ride. And it's it's pretty good. It sounds like kick axe. It's, it's got a, cool a great cover. chorus. It's a cool cover. That's a Vancouver uh, license, uh, a British Columbia license plate, I should say. That's uh, where they were based out of. Um, they're originally from Regina, Saskatchewan, but they moved out to uh, Vancouver to get involved with the music business. Um, this has a different lead singer. This has a guy by the name of Charles McNary on lead vocals. And, and strangely enough, actually on the B side, one more time, written by guitarist Ray Harvey, that's got to be Ray Harvey on lead vocals there too, because it's not the same guy that's on the A side. And that one more time is a, does not sound like kick axe. That sounds like pop. It's got this uh, synth synth thing that goes through. It almost sounds like mm -hmm. a heavier version of the Cars, maybe. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't surprise me. Because when you listen to this, well, just my initial thoughts going through the catalog. Um, uh, the fact that there are hints of pop, I can totally see that with these guys. Because these the, these records are full of hooks and yeah, there's pop undertones on this record. They're heavy, they're bombastic in spots, their uh vocals on these records we will talk about absolutely killer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that pop element, I'm not surprised because I you think know, that it's pop in there. element I, I think that comes from Ray Harvey, uh okay. personally. Because when, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. I'll, I won't say why. I think it's Ray Harvey's influence. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, this is 1981. And the band formed in 76. So they were already five years old by this point. And then they had a weird release here. They're on this compilation called Playboy Street Rock. Huh. Um, featuring bands such as Champion 5. <laughs> but there's Kick Axe. And they have a song on here called Reality is the Nightmare. It's a live track kicks axe man it's a great song um lead singer charles mcnary was not bad um but as we'll see they needed somebody with a little bit more of a unique character this is good but it's not quite what we will get what year's still, that what year is that 81 81 it i, I would still hey, recommend seeking out this track if that doesn't scream 80s mike i don't know what does well look at all that neon Oh my God. <laughs> and uh, this is on Nightlife Records, manufactured in Canada. Okay. Probably not released in the United States. Um, now, they recorded uh, an album, but it never got released. And I don't know, probably the tapes would be lost. But um, once they got in a new lead singer, George Kristen, things started to change because this guy is a very unique vocalist and and I I can't express to you uh the importance of George Kristen to this band um unfortunately he seems to be pretty much retired from rock music but that's him right there he does like gospel and country Hold up that and whole stuff. band photo for everybody yeah okay so I mean look at that band look at them they're look ready at that. That In the front row, that. we've got founding member bassist Victor Langan, still with the band today. George Kristen, lead vocals. In the middle is Ray Harvey. Mm -hmm. And on the sides are Brian and Larry Gilstrom, the brothers. Uh, and I sometimes have a hard time telling them apart. Well, they look very similar. If you ever see the video to uh, On the Road to Rock, one of the things that I really liked about this band <laughs> is the drummer Brian Gilstrom. He's literally a Hulk. Like, you know, Bobby Rock, for example, mm -hmm. from uh, Vinnie Vincent Invasion, he was always like muscular. Yeah, he was big like, dude. This guy's like that too. And uh, he, he literally looks like a Hulk. And um, I, I can't help but like that. I think they had a cool image. It was very 80s, obviously. Um, and one thing that bugged me though, and maybe this is just me, George Kristen in every live performance, photograph i've ever seen in every music video he always sings barefoot 
And I've always thought, you know, what if he stubs his toe or gets a sliver? That that always bugged me. That's, to me on stage, I would want to be wearing shoes. There's somebody but, else that goes around like barefoot like that. God, who is it? It might have been sure. the guy in Blind Melon, for all I know. It might have been. Who else? It'll come to me. But yeah, that's... Henry Rollins. Henry Rollins always mm -hmm. sings barefoot. Anyway, unimportant. Unimportant. Uh, but interesting. Uh, interesting. Uh, they signed to, uh, in Canada, CBS Records, and they needed a U.S. deal. They approached Spencer Proffer, as we talked about, Pasha, because they liked a, another record that was out at that time called Metal Health, which, correct me if I'm wrong, the first heavy metal album to go to number one. I do believe so. And I was a Quiet Riot fanatic. Um, Spencer Proffer wrote... Uh, didn't write, he co-wrote a couple of songs, but he produced this album and it has his fingerprints all over it. The drum sound is exactly Frankie Benali's drum sound from Metal Health. As soon as you hear the opening drums to Heavy Metal Shuffle, you'll be like, oh. is this Quiet Riot? Is this an unreleased Quiet Riot song? <laughs> yes. Well, and even the guitar tone. sounds like that. I mean, it when I hear it, it takes me right back to that era. But... It does have the sound, but these guys are no Quiet Riot. They're no Quiet Riot. They're heavier. Heavier. Um, more, more complex. More complex. Well, they do have two guitar players. Um, they're definitely not as like, um, you know, Kevin Dubrow has his influences. Although, ironically, Kevin Dubrow, very inf influenced by Humble Pie and 30 Days in the Hole is covered on here. Mm -hmm. Um. But this is a great album. I think if I want to be honest, there's not a bad song on this album. Heavy Metal Shuffle kicks ass. That is a slow pounder. Then we have Vices, which is just, I don't know, a fist pounder, I guess. There's so many fist pounders on this album. And a lot of great gang vocal kind of, they, they were, they're good singers. This is early gang vocal too. Yeah. I must say because, well, 84, yeah, that would be pretty early for that. If I had to say Spencer Proffer's production on this is better than Metal Health, um, you can hear the voices more clearly and mm -hmm. you can hear a lot more expression. It's not so much of a mush of background vocals. And as great as Kevin Dubrow is, I'm a huge fan. There's no comparing him to George Kristen. He is a very clean, soulful, melodic, powerful delivery. And it's hard to compare them to other singers. Right. Yeah, totally different sound. I do want to say, so we're talking about this record, is that, you know, you could, if we're going to compare them to Quiet Riot, Quiet Riot's very predictable. Mm. You know what the songs are going to do. You know where the song is going to take you to. You know you know what to expect. With Kick Axe, they are such good players. And uh, think about it. By 1984, They've been together since 77. What a, you can tell by the time they record this record, they are a seasoned machine. Mm -hmm. Okay. The band's tight. The songs are great. Cause look, they've had time to work their chops. And then Spencer uh, polished the songs. And the thing about the songs is that you never know. This is what I liked about it. Much like a progressive rock band. There are prog elements here. If you really look down deep into it, some 100%. of these tracks on this record, I don't know. I made some notes. I don't know if it was so much on this record or maybe the second album, but anyway, you never know where these tracks are going to go. They start out a certain way. You may go into a bit of an odd uh, middle eight of some sort, and the song may end up on a, in, in a different route or a different lane, so to speak, I by agree. the time it's done. You never know the way these tracks are going to go. And it's very refreshing for a band such as this. You know, I, it's what I dug about it. Cause it's like, man, these guys are fun to listen to. You know what I mean? And there's the something you said that I want to touch on, which is you, you mentioned there's a little bit of prog stuff going mm -hmm. on here. Technically Spencer Proffer considers this album to be a concept album about okay. vices and in fact, if you listen to the album through, the last track, just passing through, repeats a line from the track Vices. So, you know, there there is some, some intention there to be a little bit on the, tiny bit on the progressive side. I can, I can 
and I totally picked that up. But these yeah. guys are a lot of fun to listen to. Mm -hmm. The other thing, what was the one song I made a note on? Um, well, the other thing I've noticed about the mix, and I can't remember how Quiet Riot was mixed, but I've noticed that the bass on here is really up in the mix. You notice you ever listen like Paul McCartney, he always has his bass up like on the wing stuff. This has the bass up too. And maybe because it's one of the brothers, you know, founding member. I don't, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. Since since you mentioned bass, we just have to sh quickly show a picture of Victor Langan's bass because it's so unique. It's a custom bass. Oh, but, okay. Like that is literally an axe right there. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. But uh, I don't know. These guys, I think, I, we were talking about this prior, and I do think that these guys run on a higher, on a different level. Uh, and then I was talking to you before we recorded that I look at certain bands like Rat, uh, Doc, and I always bring that up, that I always think these guys, actually, I'm going to bring Skid Row up mm -hmm. too. I never do, but man, the more I listen to Skid Row, the more I like it, and I put those guys up on another level. Mm-hmm. But kick axe fits right in there because this is just not your typical dumb. I'm not don't I don't want to mean to come off this way, but these guys are more like a, a thinking man's hard rock metal band. Absolutely. And uh, lyrically as well. There's a lot of this stuff that that is lyrically a little bit more up there. Mm -hmm. And the uh, melodies kick ass. Mm -hmm. Kick axe. They, they really do. They right. really do. But the album didn't move. It didn't sell. I don't remember this back in the day in the States. I'm sure it got released here in the States, but I don't think it did anything, Michael, at all. It did get released in the States on the Pasha label, but like you said, didn't really do anything. Right. Um, and they that may speak to the power of CanCon, that they were able to get played on much music and, and radio in Canada because of the fact that they were born here. You know, that's an argument. There's just so you know, CanCon is very controversial, you know, so I won't get into all of that. But well, I think uh, we've touched on it before in another show. We have in the Helix series. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyway, the, the album didn't move and they were going to do a second album, but there was less support from the label. Uh, Spencer Proffer kind of took a step back a little bit and uh, he had one of his staff writers and I just looking for the name here, but they had a staff writer from Pasha that came in and worked with kick Axe on the next album, which was called, uh, welcome to the club with uh, cover art by Hugh Syme. You mentioned yeah, great cover art. Very I mean, strange though. Very strange. But you know, Michael mentioning Prague, you look at that cover, That's, that could yeah. have been a Prague album cover. Yeah. And yeah, the first album screams metal. This doesn't scream metal. No, and maybe that was a problem. Now, this album's a little bit more melodic, mm -hmm. um, a little bit more straightforward. Um, there's a track on here, um, Coming After You. Man, that song should have been a hit. Um, it's just all, I it's wrote all that, chorus. Michael, <laughs> I wrote that down too. I said, Coming After You. How did these guys not have a hit with this? This fit per perfectly on 80s, well, uh, Headbanger Ball, at least. I don't know if these guys For ever sure. got played on Headbanger Ball, but, uh, but uh, that is probably one of the highlights of this record. Great, great track. I would also name the song Hellraisers mm -hmm. as a standout. And it's really, it's kind of like a swing to it. It's hard to describe, but it has like a serious swing to it. Hellraiser. And I think a lot of that comes from George Christen's delivery, but there's mm -hmm. something swinging about that that beat. And I just really dig it. Um, the most unique song on this is their version of Joe Cocker's version of With a Little Help from My Friends, mm -hmm. which had a lot of Canadian uh, power in there with uh, Lee Aaron, uh, Andy Curran from Coney Hatch, uh, Alfie Zappacosta, who was a big solo artist in Canada. Um, who else was on this? Uh, Rick Emmett from Triumph. And yeah. uh, they did a music video, but they weren't able to get all of the faces in the music video. But Lee Aaron and Zappa Costa were in the video, and that kind of drew, drew my attention because Lee Aaron was very big in Canada. Um, but it's it, out of the blue, after all these rockers and bangers and pickaxe songs, all of a sudden you get the organ 
and da, na, 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 of, with a little help from my friends and it's a very legit version of little with a little help from my friends it's not very metal you wouldn't call it like a metal version mm -hmm. there's a lot of delicate background vocals going on and my god Kristen really kicks hit every ass in the room on lead vocals yeah he's phenomenal he's so uh, soulful i did want to mention something i oh, i guess i could wait uh i wanted to mention this on that first album the mm -hmm. the track dream about you dreaming about you god yeah. dang all the right moves too all the, the and the right background moves. vocals Yes. What, I'm gonna ask you this. What the background vocals on these records are absolutely stunning. If you're into Queen, I'm not saying these guys sound like Queen, but I think they've listened to a lot of Queen. Mm -hmm. Uh sweet. Uh yeah. I don't know. What are these background vocals on these records kind of remind you of? Because if you listen to the vices and then you listen to uh Kick Axe 4, those background vocals are still there. They're they didn't miss a beat. It's you know? because it's because these guys sing, right? And they didn't need to bring in like Motley Crue and all these other bands. They didn't well, need to bring in a, it, a, a gang of singers. It's just those guys, and they it's phenomenal. It, yeah, and I don't know who I would compare it to, Grant. That's a tough question. The but, thing is, is that this band sounds like themselves. They do, they do, and that's regardless of the fact that Spencer Proffer and his writers had a large influence on the albums. I think. I think they still let the bands be the bands. I don't think there was a lot of, I, you get the impression from the liner notes that they didn't want to necessarily go more pop and mainstream on welcome to the club, but I don't think that they were really being strangleholded here. here. I think that this was all very natural. I think it's very natural. I mean, it sounds like it has similar tendencies as the first album. It's yeah. not as bombastic as the first album. And I'm not saying that, most of the time when I don't when I use the term bombastic, it's kind of negative. But on these records, for some reason, these guys pull it off. These guys can be over the top. These guys can use different time signatures. These guys can push the limits and don't sound like it's a shtick, is what I'm trying to say. Listen, think of the well, well, grant. Welcome to the club is not as intense as the first album. Right. And think but, about this. The first album opens with that drum, but da, 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 heavy metal shuffle. Second right. album opens with jazzy chords. Darn, 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 yeah. darn, darn. And it's like, Which whoa. Is phenomenal. And it's like, this is this metal? It sounds like jazz. It, it, <laughs> it, uh, it kind of, it, you don't really expect that, but that no. opening track is so freaking good. It is, but it's so not, it, unexpected it's unexpected do you think that might have turned off people yeah i do because the 80s weren't as open-minded as we are today today you and i can listen to that and go because this shit what? that's amazing but if i was like we went 84 to 86 yeah and if you think about it that was a couple years in between and most bands didn't take a two-year break a lot of bands were doing an album a year mm -hmm. but 86 was a very busy year for kick acts um I don't want to uh, age myself, but uh, as a youngster, I was I was quite into these guys right here. Oh, there's the soundtrack. And ironically, this is the next appearance of Kick Axe, except you probably don't know it because on the back cover, they're credited as Spectre General. And they have two songs on here. They have um, Hunger, which you may know by another band called King Cobra. And a song called Nothing's Gonna Stand in Our Way. Two great songs, but things get really complicated at this point. There's an entanglement of bands involving Wasp, King Cobra, and Black Sabbath. All of them were working with Spencer Proffer at that time. Ian Gillen had left Black Sabbath. Spencer Proffer was trying to tempt George Christen into Black Sabbath as the next singer. Um, Kick Hacks were like, whoa, whoa. You know, we don't want our, our we don't want to lose our cool. singer, but they wrote three songs for the next Black Sabbath album to follow Born Again. Mm -hmm. um, those three songs were Wild in the Streets, which was recorded by Wasp, Hunger, which was recorded by King Cobra, and Piece of the Rock, which was recorded by King Cobra. And it's it's really weird to think of Black Sabbath doing Hunger. Like, what would have that sounded like? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
I, 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 I don't know, but I'd like to hear it. Yeah, yeah, I would too. But that obviously didn't happen. Um, some of these songs ended up uh, with Kick Axe. Um, Piece of the Rock is actually the very last thing that I need in my collection. Um, this is the thing that I was telling you about earlier offline. But uh, my good buddy, Jex Russell, who is right there on my shirt, I him this week and I said, buddy, I just realized I'm missing one Kick Axe track from my collection. It's called Piece of the Rock. And it's only available on a very rare 2005 reissue of Rock the World, even though it's got nothing to do with that album. That just mm -hmm. happened to be where he's like, hang on a second. He checks his CD collection. He has it. And because he is such a wonderful human being, he is sending it to me. So I oh, will now well, have. Look at you. Yeah, no kidding, right? Like I'm getting teary eyed here. You're not, you're <laughs> not, I'm not worthy. He, uh, he emailed me the MP3, so I've been listening to their version of Piece of the Rock. But, man, I can't wait to actually have the CD in my hands. I am I so know. excited. Um, but for those of you who know King Cobra, that was Carmine Apice and uh, a bunch of other dudes. And they did this track called Hunger, which was a minor hit in the United States. And that was a kick axe track from the Transformers soundtrack. <laughs> How bizarre is that? That bizarre got more uh acclaim than the you know pickaxe version did and that movie as i recall it it kind of stiffed i don't remember it being popular until it was on tv and that also has a lion track on it too right yeah a uh, weird al yankovic is on here with dare to be stupid um we have lion with the transformers themes on oh yeah, my god I played yeah, that yeah. last weekend on uh my listening party i played it oh, on sunday you? How are we out? The two uh, tracks on here by Stan Bush, by the way, are really good. If you're a rock and roll heavy metal fan, you'll probably dig The Touch, which was later made famous by Donnie Wahlberg. Or no, sorry, Mark Mark Wahlberg? Whichever Mark, one did it Mark in Boogie Wahlberg. Nights. Yeah. And a song called Dare, which is really, really good. So that, I don't know if you have the Rock Candy CD of the Lion album. No, I don't. It's got the trait. Well, you've got already got the the soundtrack CD anyway. Doesn't matter. But they put that Transformer theme song on there as a bonus track. It's really interesting. Like it. That's good. People know the song, but it's like it's a legit heavy metal version of it. It's good. It is. It's it was so bad. good. I chose it to play on my show. There you go. Oh, so you know it's good. You know you it's know, good. It has to be good. <laughs> um. Anyway, back to Kick Axe. Anyway, yeah. Um, tangent, tangent. Okay. They uh, they toured. They toured with Autograph, another band kind of on the cusp. Crocus, who are probably bigger in Europe. A little band called Night Ranger that you might have heard Never of. Never heard of them. And a couple Canadian bands, Triumph, and one that Grant has covered on his show not once but twice, but three times is yeah, Helix. We did the Helix series. Yeah, yeah, and including the episode with Martin Popoff, that was three episodes. Yeah. Um. Anyway, they didn't really have a lot of label support, and um, at one point in 1986, guitarist Ray Harvey decided he's done. He has he's going home, and he was just going to go home and deal with uh, some family matters. So they were down a member. Interestingly enough, uh, to Canadian rock fans, uh, Ray Harvey ended up touring. Uh, back in guitar with a little band called Rock and Hyde. And Rock is Bob Rock, very famous now, and yeah. his par writing partner, Paul Hyde. They were in a band called the Paolas. And they, the Paolas. Uh, that's right. And yeah. they evolved into Rock and Hyde, which uh, Ray Harvey played with. And I, I quite like the Paolas and Rock and Hyde. Really good. Um, Let me see. I guess we move on to the third album. Uh, they were yeah. still signed to CBS in Canada. Um, they were dropped from Pasha in the United States and they were picked up by Roadrunner. And that's when we get to the self-produced third album, Rock the World, the ill-fated self-produced Rock the World, um, originally going to be called The World. Um, again, produced as a four-piece. And I think this is where you notice Ray Harvey's absence. I th they're, they're much less pop on this, much more metal, mm -hmm. much more progressive, mm -hmm. uh, all over the board really this is there's nothing really mellow on this album um everything is sort of challenging the production's not what they could have done with pasha no but, i don't think the production is quite 
No, nah, production's not quite as good. I mean, when you listen to this record, you obviously know it's kick axe. It's like it I said, still there's sounds only, like kick axe. There's not like a lot of big this is a okay. I've mentioned this with another band out. I can't remember who it was, but think about it. Oh, we were talking about it on Sea of Tranquility Bread, where the pedigree I know we're talking we're talking bread on a kick axe show, but look, this is my example. You think about the pedigree of bread. David Gates had been a producer and a ranger for years. The band had been, they played for years. Look at Kick Axe. Hmm. Played together for years. 77, the first time came in 84. They were already fully realized. So when you have yeah. each album come out, well, they're not going to grow by leaps and bounds because they're they're a, 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 a seasoned band. Yeah, they well, already had done the growth. Called, right. So yeah. and that's evident that's evident by the, the, the early single. You know, it wasn't right. quite, you know, they hadn't quite found their direction yet. Right. And um, you know, Rock the World, they were forced to evolve a little bit in the yeah. sense that they were now doing it as a four piece. Look and that, um, what a good band photo. Look how freaking cool those guys look. I remember Grant sitting yeah. in my basement watching the Pepsi Power Hour. And they say, okay, we got new kick axe coming up. And all of a sudden you hear this lightning fast guitar. And this brilliantly heavy, fast song kicks in. We're into rock the world. And I think a lot of bands like Rat at that time were experimenting with faster tempos on stuff like Body Talk. Mm -hmm. And kick axe do that on this track, Rock the World. And it was, I was just like blown away. That's a great track that you mentioned that because I think for one thing about kick axe is that I think even though you look at uh, welcome to the club and you might think, well, this is a bit odd as an opening track, but still it ends up smoking and just killing it. You know, yeah, yeah. they are so good at picking tracks to open with. Mm -hmm. And of course, then they call the album the same title as the, well, it's weird. But anyway, but rock and rock the world apps just smokes. Yeah. And you know what I really like about it is that the chorus, when they had sing the chorus, is that the guitars echo it echoes the chorus. Yeah. That's good. It makes me look, I'm smiling just thinking no, about it. But it's so good. And the uh, the other thing I want to say is the guitars on this, and you mentioned being heavy. The guitars on this record absolutely kill. A lot of I'm gonna... riffs, a lot of great guitar sounds. Like the their version, they do a version of the chain by Fleetwood Mac on here. Yeah, it's so and good. Never hear a version of the chain like this ever. It's heavy. Don't you agree? You My need God. a singer of the caliber of George Kristen to do that song without sounding like an a-hole. And, and the and the thing is though, Mike, they put that on there in the second track on the yeah. Yeah, and normally they keep their covers for the last track, so yeah. it's kind of unusual to get it so early on the album. But as soon as you hear that opening harmony, yeah, with George Kristen, it's like, okay, I am sold. I'm and sold. Just, yeah, bam, bam, you know, it just that song just hits. Um, I'm going to speculate that perhaps because they were down to one guitar and Larry Gilstrom had to do all the guitars himself. Maybe that's why we're seeing so much emphasis on these really interesting little guitar bits and licks like that. Mm -hmm. um, well, and probably you, because he can work them out. And then he yeah. goes, maybe I'll just do that, and then I'll echo it. Yeah. But he's a brilliant player. And people people don't, I don't think people give these guys enough credit. But these no, guys are really good players and he's a great guitar player the guitars on here probably kick harder they kick than, axe yeah any of the kick axe albums yeah yeah for, i would say so for sure yeah um and it's it's really well written guitar parts like if you go back to the opening track rock the world mm -hmm. there's that building guitar solo and it builds and then it gets really fast and it's like you know that this guy spent time composing that guitar solo to the point where it's almost like a little mini song in within the song. And that's the kind of guitar player that Larry Gilstrom is. And that's one of many things that I really like about Kick Axe. 
Yeah. You know, I've mentioned the background vocals before, but in my notes for this record, I wrote this band may have some of the best background vocals in yeah. this type of genre during this period. I would agree fully, you know, looking at. But they're so that... creative. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You, like you look at a, a rival band, like say Quiet Riot, and a lot of the vocals are just let's put a whole bunch of guys in the room and sing the same song, the same melody. Mm -hmm. This is more separated. This is more like, okay, this guy's going to sing a little bit over here and this guy's going to mm -hmm. be singing a little bit down here. And it's much more composed in terms of backing vocals. And again, I think that comes from what you said. These guys were a seasoned band. They've been singing together the same core guys. Two of them are brothers. But the same core band without a lot of lineup changes, just the lead singer was the only lineup change of any real significance. Uh, they did have other members come and go, but the same core guys are right. the two Gilstrom brothers, Victor Langan, and occasionally Ray Harvey. Yeah. It's good. It is good, but not sustainable. They uh interesting story, I guess. Um they had unpaid debts because of the failure of the situation mm -hmm. and sheriffs literally seized their equipment on stage mid gig. And what year, band, what year was this? About 88. And they were, they broke up. They didn't have much choice in the matter. They were, it was a failing business. You have to make a living. You can't just mm -hmm. play in a band your whole life and, you know, families and stuff happen. So they disappeared for a long, long time. Um, although, interestingly, uh, George Kristen has sort of, um, he's not very active, but he does have a website where you can listen to a lot of his music. But he worked as a guitar tech for some pretty big names. Sarah McLaughlin, Dido, mm -hmm. Avril Lavigne, and Katie Lang. Gigs a gig. But, gigs a gig. So it's like, he might not have been singing, but I bet you you've seen him on a stage. Yeah. Um, but, you know, through all this, eventually bands always get back together. But George Kristen has been sort of I, I don't know how you would describe it. Maybe maybe you'd almost describe him as a recluse. He doesn't participate in the liner notes of these reissues. Um, he, he's never interviewed. Um, like I said, he's got his music up on his website, sort of a country and soul sound. But the guys otherwise completely disappeared meanwhile uh in 2004 kick axe or actually sorry 2002 kick axe decided to get back together um they needed a singer mm -hmm. so they interestingly went to gary langan the brother of victor langan and also the original drummer in the band gary langan and apparently he's a pretty good singer but it's a different sound he's got a raspier voice and I've been listening to Kick Axe for the least of the albums. Um, I just, I think it's too long. There's 14 songs on here, and I think it's a tad too long. Ray Harvey's back in the band now, as uh, you may be able to see from the band photo there. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I have, I'm of mixed feelings. When I'm listening to it, I'm enjoying it. When I'm not listening to it, I can't remember how any of the songs go except for Rockin' Days, the second song. And interestingly enough, Rockin' Days is about the incident with the sheriff repossessing the <laughs> equipment. Um, give me that guitar, boy. Your Rockin' Days are done. And that's what the song is about. Uh, what can you do when the... How's the, how's the song go? What can you do when the cops stop the show? What do you say to the sheriff on the stage <laughs> so it's like that's that's the story that is the story what do you do when the cops stop the show uh rocking days great song but i'm not i'm just not what well, do sure. you think that it you mentioned that it's way too long do you think i think it, so could there be a, a much better album if we trim some songs off of it is it just yes i think so Although if you, you asked me to pick four songs to cut to make it a 10 song album, I couldn't do it right now. Um, mm -hmm. Because again, I have a hard time remembering how these songs go after I'm done listening to the album. But, you know, all these other records are 10 song records. And I think, right. you know, 10 songs is, isn't that kind of the ideal? What did I write about this? Um, you know, 
I think, yeah, Rock and Days is the one that I mentioned really is the memorable track on here. Yeah, um, it's great. It's really great. But yeah, but the, the, the thing that I'm really amazed with, you know, with these legacy bands, we, we've had such a long time in between releases. And yeah, yeah this is 2004. Set, Last album was 1988. That's a long time. Yeah. And it just feels to me, yeah, there's some changes within the band, but it still sounds like Kick Axe. It does still sound like Kick Axe. I do miss George Kristen on lead vocals, but let's mm -hmm. not feed a dead horse. He's not coming right. back. Right. Gary Langan was a great singer. Um, I, I kind of liken him to a guy out of Buffalo named Phil Nero, who's no longer with us. But Phil Nero had kind of like a similar rasp, a similar kind of sound. Mm -hmm. And I liked Gary Langan on lead vocals. If we're going to go and get a new singer, why not a brother? Two pairs of brothers, by the way. Why How not? Many bands? There's, there are very few bands that have two pairs of brothers. Yeah. Um, I can think of DC Drive being another one out of, you know, Detroit City, DC Drive. Um, but yeah, Kick Axe 4. Unfortunately, the situation didn't last. Uh, Gary Langan eventually went back to uh, civilian life um, in 19, uh, sorry, 2008. They now have a new singer by the name name of Daniel Nargang, and I haven't really had time to absorb their new music enough. They have a brand new song out called Run to the Thunder, which is their first new song since Rockin' Days. 2004, you know? yeah. 2004, so there's another huge gap. 19-year gap. It'll be a 20-year gap when they put out their new album this year. They're going to have a new album coming out this year with Daniel Nargang on lead vocals, and then I'll have a, a chance to more appreciate Mm -hmm. what they sound like today um i can tell you though the musicianship is just as incredible as ever that has not decreased in any way even on this uh, 2004 record you listen to yeah. it and go man you guys still can play yeah. the bass is still up in the mix the drums are yes. still a little bit bombastic they have a certain tonality and i think the bass is a really important part of their sound they have a really kind of Dum, 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 kind of yeah the guy's playing very good tone. strings great tone yes yes that's right um i i love victor langan i think he's absolutely mm -hmm. a, a great bassist and who can't love that axe bass um one of a kind really <laughs> is he still playing that yeah yeah i think in the new video uh, run to the thunder i think he's playing it can't beat that can't beat that so but, yeah, that's where we are with Kick Axe today. Um, we have a new album imminent and, you know, four fifths of the classic lineup intact, which Grant, how many bands of this not nature? Many. Not many. Dokken, you got one legacy member. Rat, mm -hmm. you got, I don't know. I don't, I don't think let's, Rat's let's even, not even go there. Well. You know, Great White, you've got like, I don't know, two legacy members. Most of these bands are down to one to two legacy members. Kick Axe are at four fifths uh autograph doesn't have any members anymore yeah and neither does april wine as far as i know all these bands um quiet riot um so this is something um i, I know martin popoff uses the phrase compromised lineups no quiet is... right though rudy sars isn't quiet right isn't he he's yeah back uh, in there yes but he's not an original member uh the original member was kelly garney on bass yeah, but he still was playing with Randy, yes, though. Yes, but, you know, they that's what they need. They they need to keep, like, one guy from the 80s in that band. Before mm -hmm. him, they had Chuck uh, Chuck Wright, yeah. who played on Quiet Riot 3 and a couple songs. He played on, like, two songs on Metal Health. But it seems like to keep that band going, they need to have, like, one legacy member. And Rudy Sarzo has stepped up to be that guy. I'm good with that. I'm, I'm good, good with, with that. Rudy. I'm not going to say anything bad about Quiet because, Riot. Because, and the only reason I say that is because he was part of that classic lineup. A major and part like of it. Brian, we're on a tangent, but bear with us. Brian Greenway, part of the classic April Wine lineup. So I give the, these guys a pass. Sure. Because, you know, Brian Greenway's been there since, you know. Forever. Forever. Yeah. So. No, I, absolutely. Quiet Riot. And, and besides, one of the original era quiet riot albums the self-titled 1988 album had no original members either that was paul shortino and lead vocals and i love paul shortino but that's a whole other band <laughs> i know but we're talking music people so it doesn't yeah. matter it doesn't oh, it's, matter. it's all related because all related. Quiet riot were an influence on that first 
Vice's album by Kick Axe, mm -hmm. especially that drum sound. I have absolutely no doubt that they said, get me the Frankie Benali drum sound. And that's exactly what they did. It's identical. It's identical. Those toms. Oh, God, it's so good. So good. I love that drum sound. Mm -hmm. Metal Health was my first hard rock album. So when I hear Vice's, it's almost like more Metal Health. <laughs> kind of. It's got better than metal all better. It is better. it is better. better. It is better. Um lyrically better, um, musically more challenging, um more integrity. So uh, if you're gonna rank these, how would you rank these? It's pretty simple, Grant. Um I I again I hate to say anything bad, but this would go on the bottom of the pile as my number four. Yeah, I agree. My number three would be Rock the World. Um, uh, yeah. it just doesn't have a punch of the first two albums and then things get really tough really 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 right. tough i think i think i would put welcome to the club as my number two with vices as number one by a hair by a hair both of those are strong there is no sophomore slump here uh you could get well actually you could probably get any of the first three and absolutely you couldn't make a mistake do it because they're all rock candy and they have their own value you know the thing about rock candy i want to say if you see something on their website or whatever and they have it in print get it while you can get it yes. because a lot of these i don't depending on the licensing and whatnot you never know how long these are going to be in print and uh, the kick axe they're still available and you can get order them from rock candy. And actually when you order them from rock candy, the shipping from the UK, at least to the States, God, well, it took like a week. They get them right out to you. So I was always, I'm amazed with that, but uh, yeah, I would highly recommend anyone to go check those out. If, if I mean, we're not going to try to bullshit you. No. No, I, no, I really may great, really great. I stuff. may be Canadian and I may have that bias, but um, I do love this band. And uh, again, the interesting thing is, it was only five years ago that I finally completed my Kick Axe collection. So, yeah. you know, this is all somewhat fresh to me, but yet not because I grew up on all these singles and videos when I was a youngster. Well, let me ask you this, Mike. You got a couple minutes. I have another yeah. show here in ten minutes, but what do you? think? Why didn't Kick Axe take hold in Canada? Do you have any idea? Well, what do you think it was. I'm not sure that Canada is especially friendly to domestic metal bands. Um, we had Triumph. They're not really metal. No, they we had are. Rush. Not. They're not metal. They're, not they're metal. hard rock. They're progressive rock. Um, pompous, perhaps. Um, as far as Canadian well, metal bands, Felix. Felix is about as big as they got, and and really, it was um, even Helix should have been bigger. I don't know. I just don't think Canada is, regardless of the CanCon thing. I think Canada is more. Let's find the next Brian Adams. Let's find the next Gordon Lightfoot, for that matter. And heavy metal just didn't seem to be a part of the heritage that. Canada wanted to have anything to do with mm. with Voivod out of Quebec and they should have been much bigger too. But um, they're nothing here. And they're well, the, you know, that's unfortunate because Voivod, oh yes, that's a band too. But <laughs> Coney Hatch, I'll bring Coney Hatch up. Coney Hatch, Hard Rock. Um, I, I think Coney Hatch were pretty big in Canada, but again, they didn't break to that. We're Brian Adams level or Corey Hart for that matter, you know? Well, you know, Martin's theory is, is that a lot of these Canadian bands, unless they move to the States, there's that too. To LA from Canada. There's that too. And uh, they really didn't get much promotion here from the record companies because, no. well, they weren't on site, so to speak. He might have something, but well, uh, you know, in, in, didn't even make a real dent in Canada. That's why I'm just like surprised yeah. because they have everything. It's, they have it's everything that they should have been successful here. It's it's per. I, I think in Canada there was so much pigeonholing with music that something like "On the Road to Rock," which would have been their biggest tune, mm -hmm. gets played nonstop on the Pepsi Power Hour, but doesn't get played at all during the other 
23 hours of the day. Um, it only gets played, you know, during the rock focused shows on radio, you know, that kind of thing. It just, it, it, there was no crossover potential. Um, Helix at least had a ballad that was able to get played on different radio stations, but Kickaxe really, they didn't really do ballads. Um, the closest thing they had to a ballad was uh, with a little help from my friends. And even that didn't, well, by then it might've been too late because the labels weren't really supporting them anymore. Yeah. Well, and plus, I, well, we talked about it. I think that second album, you look at the cover and it doesn't scream anything heavy. No, and, the and it doesn't gone. scream. It screams more prog to me than anything. Uh, right. And I don't know. Maybe right. that had something to do with it. I know. I know. Branding is very important. You know, here's two Kick Axe albums with that logo, yeah. that really cool logo. But Suck then here's one no the logo. Club. That's something that Tim Durling would probably have a lot to say about because you know how logo focused he is and packaging and everything. And I think that stuff matters. I think if you've got a great logo, look at April Wine. You know, when they came to uh, the States and got signed to Capital, that's where that logo, Capital must have produced that great April Wine logo. And then, you know, if you look at Walking Through Fire, they don't have the logo on there. And if you have such a great band logo, use it for crying out loud. And Kick Axe is one of those bands with a great logo. Why you didn't use it on the uh, second album, I don't know. You know, I'm I'm sitting here, I'm staring at my screen and right behind you, there's a Van Halen logo. Right. And it's striking. And you right. know immediately what it means. And even just the shape of it right. tells you what the music's going to sound like. On the other side, I see the Beatles logo, that font. And right. they've made that font their own thing and that tells a right. whole other story that beatles logo and the kick axe logo told its own story and yeah when they lost it on welcome to the club regardless of the hugh syme cover art um they lost some kind of communication with the buyer mm -hmm. the buyer can't pick that up and say well this is gonna rock because he doesn't know yeah they don't know the name sounds heavy but that doesn't necessarily mean anything that doesn't mean anything at all Right. It sounds heavy, but it doesn't look heavy. Yeah. Well, at least on that record. Yeah, it doesn't but, look heavy, but it does look like something that maybe a, a Rush single could have looked like. Like even the logo kind of looks like a Rush, almost like a Rush font, you know, at some point in the <laughs> it 80s. Could have, it could have been Rush. Yeah, yeah. Well, you saw Who knows? It, you know, that's, that's his right. style. Yeah. Great cover, though. It's still a great cover. It is. I still it like is. it. I like, wish the I like logo sometimes work. Yeah, I wish the logo was on it, but whatever. Yeah. All right, I guess we can wrap this dog up, Mike. I figured... well, Grant, did we get your ratings? Did we get your oh, ratings? My ratings match yours one hundred percent. Okay, well, I guess great minds think alike. I guess we've uh, at least, hopefully, sold a copy of Vices to the audience. I hope, but the first two records, yeah, could flip. Yeah, easily, easily flip. Depending it just depends on the mood. upon the mood. Yeah. Depending on the weather. On the weather. <laughs> I would go and check out any of these albums. I mean, they're all worth something. Yeah. That yeah. was our ranking, but whatever. They're all very uh close, I'd say. Um, so anyway, hopefully you're turned on. You want to check out some kick acts. That's all we're here to do is try to yeah. turn you on to these bands. And on this channel, we like to talk about those bands no one's talking about, and no one is talking kick acts for crap. Nobody's talking kick acts. So it's what we're here to do. So, Mr. Lodano, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Is there anything uh, you want to promote or anything coming up on your channel that we could uh, look forward to? I don't really have a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, cottage season is starting again, so I'm hoping to be live streaming Friday afternoons, uh, either at 3 o'clock or 7 o'clock. Um, that's the plan for the spring and the summer. So check us out at Grab a Stack of Rock on YouTube. Please subscribe. I, uh, I need the help. <laughs> Yeah, but I just uh, his links are down below. So there you go. Got the channel. Please like, subscribe, give Mike some love, and uh, you know we're all in this together, ladies and gentlemen. So yeah, he has got a lot of great content. So uh, nice. we'll have Mike on. I don't not sure what we'll cover, but we should get we should do another one of these. There has to be a, another band that needs examined for God's sakes like this. You know? I will come at you with some suggestions and then we shall chit and chat. All right, let's do it. All That's right, everybody. All.
subscribe to his channel, subscribe to mine, please like, please let you let us know if you know kick axe and you like these yeah movies, yeah know. drop a comment drop a comment always we always look at them and even if you don't like kick axe we want to hear about that too so anyway check them out and uh what's next on the channel god only knows but uh i don't know well well i do have a ranking i don't know when this is coming out but tim derling and i just got done ranking the catalog of 38 special Ooh. and i just put that up today and it's going to premiere uh what's tomorrow the 18th on my channel but it'll by the time this is up it'll already be up but uh check that out we went down a lot of rabbit holes in that show so i right. can't wait mike thanks for doing it we will see you and we'll see everybody later have a good we'll see you soon grant take care okay. see you